Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Olivia, and I am an alcoholic. I want to thank Dave for asking me to speak tonight. Oh, there's a little clock up here. I love it. Um, I want to thank Dave for asking me to speak here tonight. And uh, I was telling him, this is really overwhelming. I have not been in a room with this many nice people in a really long time. It's awesome. And, uh, you know, I'm so excited. Uh, we came out with a car full of girls, uh, girls I sponsor, and girls they sponsor or have sponsored, and um, people came up from other places. And if you're new here tonight, I really want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous and, and let you know that um, sponsorship has – been one of the most important aspects of my sobriety and one of the greatest gifts that I've gotten from this program, you know, to, uh, there are a lot of times that life gets tough in sobriety because life continues to happen and I think this isn't worth it, you know, and some girl comes along behind me and I get to share experience with her that I thought was going to be so horrible and I would never, you know, I can't imagine anybody else having to go through this and, and the gift of being able to share that experience and walk somebody else through a similar situation is so beautiful here and, um, tell you a little bit about me. I uh, currently live in New York City. Um, my home group's the Atlantic Group. We meet uh, Tuesday nights at 60th and Park. If you're ever in Manhattan and you want to come by, we would love to have you. And uh, <clears throat> my sobriety date is August 16th of 2000. And uh, I have a sponsor. Her name is Sally Coonan. And her sponsor's name is Stacy. And, um, you know, like I said, sponsorship has been really important. I, if you're new, I, I don't say those names because I expect you to know these people or be impressed by them by any means. I say that because Active sponsorship has really been the pillar of my sobriety. Um, I come up with really wacky ideas. In fact, um, my uh, solutions to problems are often worse than the problems themselves. And, uh, you know, so having a sponsor, someone that I can bounce my ideas off of, who can often feed them back to me in a way that they sound dramatic or dra- drastically different from what I thought I just said to her, um, really has, has changed some of the decisions that I've been able to make in my life. And, uh, you know, I'm originally from Los Angeles. I uh, was born and raised in a beach city um, outside of L.A., and um, there's a place in our big book that talks about how the alcoholic life becomes the only normal one. And um, I had never lived in anybody else's skin or had anybody else's life, so I thought that my life was very normal for a long time. And, uh, you know, I'm the youngest of four kids, and uh, my parents hated each other. They divorced when I was, like, three, three and a half. And uh, when I was eight, my father came out of the closet as a gay man, and uh, – my brothers were um, active in their own issues, and uh, they were going in and out of jail, and there were police at our house on a regular basis, and I was paid to babysit myself because I was such a brat, nobody wanted to spend any time with me, and, you know, I did not know that that was abnormal, um, but I've come to learn that that's not a typical childhood, um, and, uh, you know, from the gate, I was just restless, irritable, and discontent. I was so uncomfortable in my skin, and uh, I don't have a lot of memories growing up. I have glimpses here and there, um, but what I've learned is that to form memories, you have to be paying attention to what's going on in your surroundings, and I was so self-centered that I never took in what was going on in the world around me. It was all in me, my head, what you were doing to me, how what you were saying or doing affected me, and what I needed to do to either, like, impress you or get by or succeed. I just, I constantly had these wheels spinning, looking around at people, not understanding how they were functioning in the world. I just didn't get it. And, uh, and I will tell you that alcohol uh, preserved my sanity until I could get to Alcoholics Anonymous. My first obsession before drinking was suicide. I don't know where I learned the idea about suicide. I don't know where I came up with it. But um, long before I ever put a drink or a drug into my system, I was absolutely obsessed with suicide. I wanted out. I did not like the way I felt in my skin. And uh, I, you know, I'll tell you, um, I don't know if I actually wanted to die. I just didn't want to feel the way I felt. So I would, you know, write fake suicide notes and fantasize about my funeral. I love to play funeral. I, I did. I mean, I really love to play funeral. I would drink and uh, I'd lay in my bed at night and I would think about how I was going to off myself and how everybody was going to be so upset and all those people that had hurt my feelings or done things to me were going to show up at my funeral and cry and wish they had done that and you know, never hurt me, and and then I would get bored with my own funeral, I would start killing off members of my family, and, you know, I am a very morbid drinker, I am, like, a tortured soul, and, uh, 
you know, I just, I love that stuff. And uh, if I if I don't treat my alcoholism today, I can go right back there. I'm like worst case scenario girl. Um, my father, he, said he flies small planes and he would have to get special permission to like not fly over the ocean when we, when I was growing up because I would start freaking out and hysterically crying because I was convinced that the plane was going to go down. I'm going to get eaten by sharks. We're all going to die. And this is what I walked around with until I was able to find alcohol. Um, it was a little intense to say the least. And, uh, when I was 13 years old, my family moved from uh, the place that I had grown up to this little town. It's really only about 20 minutes away. But, you know, when you're 13 and you move to this new place and I didn't know anybody and uh, I was absolutely convinced that my parents moved me there because they hated me. They wanted me to suffer. They were trying to punish me for some, you know, God knows what. And uh, and I just hated it. And that was when I started actively trying to take my own life. And uh, it was shortly thereafter that that I met some people in that town who like to drink. And these people like to drink the way that I have come to learn I like to drink. And uh I, don't really, I didn't really like women for a long time um, until I was, like, well into my sobriety. So it was uh, me and these six guys, and uh, that's the way I like to drink. And we got a fifth of Jack Daniels and, uh, you know, popped the cap on that and passed it around the circle, and it came to me, and I drank as much as I could as fast as I could. And passed it around, it came to me, and I did the same thing again. And, and I will tell you that um, I love whiskey. I, I, there, I love a lot of things, but I absolutely love whiskey and Malibu rum. I just – those – uh, they, they, alcohol fixes something in me that needs fixing. We were talking about it at dinner tonight. You know, it's like I heard a speaker one time say that, that a few drinks of alcohol for me is like being hugged by God. I totally get that. Um, it doesn't happen to my sister and some members of my family when they drink. But, um, you know, I, I described to you a little bit about what I am like on the natch. And so you put a few drinks in me, and it's like, oh, I just feel better. And, you know, I don't remember a lot from that night. I remember Blink, uh, you know, being in a car and Blink getting sick somewhere and Blink were running from cops and Blink were at the beach and Blink I'm on the front porch and I've got a new boyfriend. And, uh, you know, I will tell you that my drinking did not change much from that day to the day I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I, uh, I've always been a, either a blackout or a brownout drinker. Um, but I, I very early in my drinking came to the conclusion that if I didn't remember, I probably had a great time. And so for a long time, I really thought my drinking was a lot of fun, and uh, I loved it. You know, I absolutely loved the effect that alcohol produced in me, and I did not become a daily drinker at 13, but I will tell you that I very quickly started rearranging my life to take the walk to the drink. You know, I surrounded myself with people who drank like me. I went to places. I didn't understand what people did in places where they didn't drink or why you would want to be in places where people didn't drink. I absolutely loved drinking, and I, I rearranged my life so that I could drink as often as possible. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I'm a blackout drinker. I... I often, um, you know, do things that embarrass me or somebody I'm with. And, uh, you know, so it wasn't long into my drinking that I started having to, like, dodge and, and dive around people and find out from people the next day what I had done or who I, who was mad at me, who I owed apologies to. And, you know, it was just very quickly into my drinking that the problems started to pile up. And, uh, you know, I started trying to control and enjoy my drinking. And I will tell you, if you're new, I did not know most of this until I did an inventory in Alcoholics Anonymous. I really came to AA and would have told you that I wasn't a bad drinker, that I, you know, drank like everybody else, and I never hurt anybody. But um, I, I learned in my journey here that, uh, you know, it was maybe a year or two into my drinking that I started desperately trying to control and enjoy my drinking. And I did that, you know, with a lot of ways. I, I, uh, I thought that I was trying to find myself, and so every six months or so I would change friends, and I would have told you at the time I was trying to find my people. Just need to find my people. And, uh, you know, it wasn't – wasn't those kids. It was the punk rock kids. You know, they're my people. They understand me. And uh, and I will tell you that I absolutely love the punk rock scene. I You know, I love uh, going to shows, and it was a bunch of angry kids, and we smashed things, and I absolutely love setting things on fire and driving drunk. I, I, not necessarily proud to admit that in a normal crowd, but I think you people can understand. Um, I just, I love that. I love the adrenaline rush of it. I love, in California, we don't have winters, so um, in the roads, there's these little bumps in the middle of the road, and we used to call it driving by Braille. And uh, I just love that, you know, because you can have, like, double vision, you just cover one eye, you drive by Braille, and it's all good, you know. And uh, and I, I get a thrill from things like that, you know. And, and uh, like I said, you know, I was desperately trying to control them and enjoy my drinking, and, you know, I was changing friends, and that wasn't working. And in January of 2000, a uh, few things happened, and the heat was on. You know, I, I was 17 years or 16 years old at the time. I got caught at school drunk, and I was being expelled, and you know, I had driven there, and they figured that out. So then I was facing DUI charges, and it was a big mess. And my father at this time was about six years sober in AA, and I called him up, and I was like, Dad, I need help. Take me to AA. And um, like a good card-carrying member of Al-Anon, he was excited to, you know, show this 
program to his daughter, and he invited me to a meeting, and well-meaning women gave me their phone numbers and, and did their best to try and help me, but I will tell you, I had absolutely no interest in this solution at that time. And in the six months that followed, I, I really um, w went with an abandon to try and, and manage my drinking. And I failed miserably, obviously, because I ended up right back in Alcoholics Anonymous. But, um, you know, I tried, <clears throat> I'll just get a little bottle. If I just get a little bottle, I'll get just where I need to be. I won't overshoot the mark and everything will be okay, you know. But I get drunk and I get friendly and I'm like, have a sip, it's fine. But then someone would take a sip and I would think, I don't know how much is in there now. Did you, like, gulp it or do you chuck it? I mean, did you a little sip? Like, do you just taste it? Because you're throwing my calculations off. And I would think, F it, I'm just drinking. And uh, I had this grand idea that if you didn't see me take the drink, I'm not drinking. So I would hide my alcohol in another room, and I would just, you know, like every five minutes probably go into that next room and take shots and do what I needed to do, and I would come out, and obviously I would make the same fool of myself. And, um, you know, we were talking about opening the, the car door on the highway, and, you know, one time I was in the back seat of my friend's car, and I'm like, I'm going to be sick, 70 miles an hour down the highway, and I just opened the door, you know, and uh, I didn't think much of it at the time. You know, there's puke all over the back of her car, and she drove me to work the next day and made me clean it off in front of my workplace. I was so embarrassed. But, um... You know, at the time, that was a small price to pay for getting the next drink in my system. And, you know, I just, I tried anything and everything I could think of. And uh, somewhere probably about March of 2000, um, I was at a party one night, and somebody introduced me to methamphetamines. And I thought I had found the magic solution to my drinking problem. Um, you know, but that night, I was drinking Jägermeister and, and had done some methamphetamines. And I, I had probably the worst blackout I've ever had. You know, I was getting violent with people. And anybody who knows me, I've never been in a fight in my life. I'm a big weenie. I hate confrontation. I will avoid it like the plague. But this night, you know, I was throwing bottles at people, and I was cussing people out, and I came to the conclusion the next day that I could no longer mix my drinking and my drug use, and, uh, and so I stopped drinking, and I thought that I had really found the solution to my problem, and, uh, you know, from March to June, I, I didn't touch a drop of alcohol, and I thought, problem solved. You know, I had no idea that I was the same person doing the same things, lying, cheating, stealing, um, you know, picking up the same tabs, and uh, I didn't understand why things weren't getting better, you know, and... Um, <clears throat> In June of 2000, um, I came up with my grandmaster plan. I just thought it was really the best plan I'd ever come up with. I, uh, I got a job with a petting zoo in Riverside, California, and uh, I thought people are my problem. I just need a fresh start, get away from it all. I'm going to go. I'm going to live with the llamas and the camels. I'm going to get some money in my pocket. I'm going to drive, you know, a bobcat all day, and I don't need people, and it's going to be okay. And uh, I came back, and I told my dad, who uh, – you know, my dad was a physician, and uh, he still is, but he worked in locked psychiatric units, and so he was seeing my friends now on a regular basis and knew exactly what was going on in my life. But as a good card-carrying member of Al-Anon, he did not say a word to me. And so my father was like, I think that is a great idea. You know what? I know somebody who lives in that area. Why don't you come meet me at the Monday Night Ohio Street meeting? I'll introduce you to her. Maybe you can stay with her for a while while you get settled. And uh, I will tell you, I bought it, hook, line, and sinker. I showed up at that meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous with no intention of getting sober. I just needed a place to stay. I wanted a fresh start, and I was out. And, uh, you know, I'd been to AA meetings. My dad got sober when I was 10. I'd been to meetings before. You know, I knew these people. I really thought I knew how AA worked. Uh, you know, I could have told you I was an old hat there because I'd been to maybe, like, six meetings in my life. But, you know, we walked in, and I'm saying hi to people. Like, I own the place. And, um <clears throat> I'm assuming he saved me a seat. I really don't remember. This meeting has about 160 to 200 people, but I turned around and that man was gone. And these women started coming at me with their smiles and their teeth and their phone numbers, and they were like, I'm Jennifer. I'm Harmony. I'm going to be your temporary sponsor. Call me tomorrow. And I was so overwhelmed. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, but you know what? I, I don't know what was different but between January and June, but something had changed in me. I was tired of fighting. I, I really don't know. Call it the grace of God. But um, I'd had a bad weekend the weekend before. Like I said, I hadn't touched a drop of alcohol in probably four or five months. And the weekend before, I'd had a, you know, a really unfortunate thing happen for an alcoholic like me. I, uh, somebody hurt my feelings when I wasn't drunk enough. <laughs> and that is a terrible thing for someone like me because I don't process feelings well, drunk or sober. But I didn't, I wasn't drunk enough, and, uh, you know, I went with abandon, and I, I'm not a wine drinker, I apologize to the wine drinkers in the house, but I, I'm just not a wine drinker, and, and uh, you know, I went in, and I got my mom's biggest bottle of wine, and I started chugging that as much as I could, and I don't know if that registered something different in me, I, I really don't know what had changed, but something happened, I, that Monday night meeting, I called that woman who told me she was going to be my temporary sponsor the next day, and I, uh, I didn't come back to a meeting the next night. She convinced me to come back to one a few days later on a Thursday night, and I showed up at this meeting. It's called the Key Group Meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and this kind, well-meaning, and very intimidating woman 
suggest that I take a commitment at that meeting and that I get involved in this group. And I proceeded to tell her that, you know, I'm very busy. I have a very big life. I, uh, I want you to know that it was like me alone in my room. The phone was not ringing. I, nobody was calling me anymore. I had blown through everybody in my small town that I could – I had no friends left. Um, but, I, you know, I'm busy. And uh, I have a very important life. I'm not going to be able to commit to this whole AA thing. And uh, that was at the beginning of the meeting. And by the end of that meeting, this woman, she just, she didn't even do anything to intimidate me. I just, her presence. And what I've learned is that she saw through my alcoholism like nobody had ever done before. She saw right through me and did not buy anything that I was selling. I'd been trying to get by on being cute or being friendly or whatever it was, balk off charm, you know. And uh, she wasn't buying any of it. And by the end of that meeting, I was so intimidated by this woman, I took a commitment. And I started my journey here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, it's important that I tell you that I thought this was Alcoholics Anonymous um, and that was that we were not drinking. And so I did not drink, and I started to claim sobriety and take chips and get commitments. I had seven commitments at seven meetings. I was active in a home group. I was in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I was still recreationally smoking methamphetamines because I really didn't think that was a part of this whole sobriety thing. I thought not drinking was hard enough, so I didn't expect you guys to, like, want me to give up everything. I mean, I thought, I'm not drinking. That's, that's a big deal, right? Um, and I will tell you that the meetings I got sober in, I was just home a couple weeks ago, and I heard it in the format. I don't know how I missed it. At every single meeting I was attending, it is in their format that they say, like, you know, we celebrate, they call them birthdays in California, but they were like, we celebrate birthdays here. We define a birthday as nothing that affects you from the neck up. No alcohol, pills, pot, booze, or any other substances. They say it at every meeting. Totally missed it. So I was coming to meetings, I was in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous, I knew everybody, I felt like I was somebody in AA, you know, and this was the first time that people had been friendly to me in a long time. I absolutely loved you guys. I didn't like, like the, like, don't drink, like, join this whole happy band of givers thing. I wasn't into that, but I really liked that people were nice to me. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you that I, um, I was absolutely obsessed with drinking. I, I hadn't really, when I was drinking, the thing was, it was like, there was no space between thought and action. So if I wanted to drink, I drank. I mean, it was no, I didn't think twice about it. And now I was sitting in AA meetings and uh, trying not to drink, and I thought it was the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. I spent probably 22 hours a day thinking about alcohol and drinking and what I missed about it and loved it. And I would see billboards and start crying and hear ads on the radio and call my sponsor hysterical. I mean, I was not someone who walked into these rooms and the obsession was lifted. And uh, I admire those people, but that is just not my story. If you're new here tonight and you're thinking about drinking, welcome. Um... But anyway, so I, you know, like I said, I, I was lying about my sobriety. I had no idea I was lying. I figured it out eventually, and I thought, you know what? I've worked really hard for these 60 days, so I'm just going to lie for a couple years. And then when I'm, like, four or five years sober, if I lose 60 days, it's not a big deal. But, like, right now, I've taken chips. These people have seen me. I don't want to look bad in front of them. I'll just, I'll, I'll lie for a little bit. And uh, I think I made it about 30 days. Um, all of a sudden, it just seemed like every meeting I was at, they were talking about honesty. People were talking about this being a rigorously honest program. And I was coming out of my skin. I sat in that chair, and I just thought somebody was going to come tap me on the shoulder and say, Libby, you've got to go. We don't want liars here. I was so paranoid. Um, if you're new, uh, we love liars. Come on in. Um, but at the time, I didn't know, and I thought everybody was going to kick me out, and so I was really trying to lie, and I just couldn't take it. I called my sponsor one day, and I was like, can we have coffee? I need to talk to you. And my sponsor, <clears throat> you guys don't know her, but she's a little intense, and she was like, what? Just tell me now. And uh, she did not want to meet me for coffee and, like, coddle me. And, uh, you know, so I made my big confessional to her, and she was like, when was the last time you got loaded? And I said, I, I don't know, maybe a month ago. And she looked at her calendar, and she said, August 16th, that's your new sobriety date. See you at the meeting. Click. <laughs> and she hung up on me. And, um, you know, when I started my journey here, uh, you know, my real journey, <laughs> um, I, uh, August 16th is my sobriety date, and I hope I never have to change it. And, uh, you know, like I said, I was already in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had commitments at all my meetings. I was active in a home group. Um, but what I had to start doing was being honest with people, which was new for me. I'm a liar by nature. And, uh and, you know, I'm the type of person that if we're standing around swapping stories and I don't feel like my story's cool enough, I'll just make one up because it's better, you know, that way. And uh, I try not to do that today, but, you know, that's how I was when I came to AA. And, and so, you know, I had to start being honest with people, and that was very difficult for someone like me. But, uh, you know, when I, I was asked that when I got to a podium that I'd be honest about what had ha been happening, and um, people, you know, asked what was going on, and I told them and those types of things. And my sponsor, I had taken a bunch of chips dishonestly, and um, – she suggested that I go back to those meetings and give them back their chips and let them know that I had taken those honestly and that, you know, I should give them back. And I thought she was asking me to walk the plank. I don't tell you that. I thought this was the most mortifying thing. How could this woman ask me to do this? Isn't it enough? I have to share it from the podium. I mean, I was just horrified. 
I have learned today um, that the reason she asked me to do that was because these meetings were really poor. They were struggling in their seventh tradition. They didn't have enough money to buy chips. So she just thought, well, if you took them dishonestly, give them back. You know? But for like seven years in AA, I really thought she did it to like humble me. Um, but that's not the story. But, um, you know, that's what I thought. At the time, it worked like a charm. I never wanted to change my date again. I was so done with that. And, um, you know, I was about 60 days sober this time. And I was coming out of my skin. It was October of 2000, and uh, I was either going to drink or kill myself. I could not stand the way I felt in my skin. Um, I really thought that, like, my job was to come to AA, show up to a few meetings, and everything gets better. And in my first four months of sobriety, I became homeless. The car that I had exploded while I was driving up to a meeting one night. Um, I uh, I couldn't stay where I was staying because I couldn't stay sober, so I had to move in with my father and uh, get a job, and nobody would hire me because I had these restrictions, that I had to be at meetings every night, and people wanted me to work late, and I mean, my life just, it got worse before it got better, and, uh, and I thought, what am I doing in AA? This is horrible, and by, you know, October of that year, I was coming out of my skin, and uh, I'd never felt this crazy drunk or sober, and uh, my sponsor told me, you know what, Olivia, if you don't write a four-step, you're going to drink again, and uh I didn't really like the idea of, of this whole A thing and the work that we do here, but um, I didn't want to drink again. I'd been around here just long enough that uh, I, I will tell you, when I was new, if you had over two years of sobriety, I didn't really believe that you were honest. I thought there's no way people stay sober more than two years. So I didn't even listen to that. I just thought they were all lying. But the people with like 60 days, 90 days, you know, a year or two years, I really wanted what they had. They seemed happy. They were bright. They looked friendly. I mean, they just seemed to be enjoying life in a way that I did not know was possible, and at least not sober. I knew how to do that. You know, I know how to have fun drinking. I did not know how to have fun sober, and, and I wanted what these people had, and so I started that four step, but you know, what I'll tell you is that um, I started doing the work here, and I felt better, so I stopped writing, because there's no need to keep doing the work. I feel better, and uh, you know, in December of that year, again, I was, I was at the jumping off place. You know, I had started um, doing all the same things that I, I was doing drinking that I, I was I didn't know I could do sober. You know, I was sleeping around again. I was stealing. I was lying. I was doing everything, and I was, again, coming out of my skin. And, and I finished that fourth step, and uh, I sat down with my sponsor, and I did a fifth step, and it was the first time in my life that I had ever looked at myself, ever. I always describe it as like driving a station wagon, you know. It was like I was driving around, and things would happen. i just throw it in the back. Just throw it in the back. Always look forward. It's your fault. Throw it in the back. Throw it in the back. And when I got sober, it was like that. I was slammed on the brakes. And all of that stuff came flying at me, and I thought I was going to drown. I just, I felt on a daily basis like I couldn't breathe. I had so much anxiety and so much shame and so much guilt and so much remorse for the way that I had been living and the things that I had been doing. I was, I was in high school, and I got sober, and I would look around in my classes, and I just knew that the girls in my classes were not living the way that I was living. I knew that they were living differently, but I didn't understand how to live the way that they were living. And, uh, you know, I did this fifth step with my sponsor, and I saw in black and white why I felt so bad about myself. <laughs> I had been living a pretty crappy life. Um, I was living a very selfish life. I was hurting anybody and anyone who came in my path. You know, it, if you got in the way between me and a drink, it did not matter what I had to do. You needed to get out of the way. And, uh, you know, it was no wonder that I felt the way that I felt about myself. And, you know, so I did this fifth step, and I saw, like I said, that I had tried to control and enjoy my drinking and that I had done harms to people. And, you know, we went on, and, and I wrote an eighth step list, and I started going out and making amends. And I will tell you, I was like nine months sober when I was, you know, a little bit into my amends. And, and from the day that I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and, until then, I thought about drinking every single day. Um, in my early sobriety, I got really active in AA, and um, I, uh, my sponsor gave me direction that I couldn't listen to the radio because I'm a big – I like – well, we've talked about me playing funeral, but, like, I like to feed my mood. You know, if I'm in a bad mood, I want, like, angry music. If I'm in a sad mood, I put on the morbid music. You know, I like to feed it. I want to feel it in its, like, entirety. And so I was doing this in my early sobriety and making myself crazier and um, riding that roller coaster, you know, just intense ups and downs. And so I got direction that I had to listen to AA speaker tapes in my car. I could no longer listen to the radio. And, and I will tell you, that saved my life. And I fell in love with AA speakers. And I started getting falling in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I wanted to go to conventions. I wanted to meet these people. You know, I started going out, and we had fun sober. I mean, the first year of my sobriety, I have to say, was probably the best year of my life. It was one of the hardest years of my life. If you're new, it was not easy by any means. But it was one of the best years of my life. You know, I hope that you get yourself a group of friends. Because that's what we did. There was like 15 of us, and we were crazy, and we were young, and we were sober. And we started going out and having fun sober. And I didn't know that this was possible. You know, we started planning sober camping trips and sober dances. And we, you know, we went out on Friday and Saturday night. And 
I call it the call of the wild would hit me on like Monday. You know, I start that panic because I was, you know, it, it, I was like seven or eight years sober before this left. But I felt I had this old idea that like if I was not out on a Friday or Saturday night, I was a loser, period. So Monday would come and I would start thinking like, what are we doing this weekend? We got to, what are we going to do? We got to make plans. What are we going to do? You know, and I was just like, the panic would set in and I would have to find plans. And, and you know what we did? We went out on Fridays and Saturday nights and I joined a sober softball team and I just threw myself in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, you know, I, um, it took me a while to catch on with the like taking AA out into the world. So I was really good at getting my A plus and AA for a really long time. I showed up to meetings. I was friendly. I could stick my hand out. I loved working with new people. Um, you know, my sponsor was not the type of person who said you need to work all 12 steps before you can, you know, work with someone. She was like, give them your number. If you've got eight days and they've got four, you can show them how to get to eight days. Get out there. You know, my sponsor can, like, sniff out a newcomer in a room like nobody else. It was amazing. You know, I, we would we, – our my home group in Los Angeles was about – I don't know, seven or 800 people. And no matter what, I would go out on that Wednesday night and I would find this woman and she would be talking to a girl with like three days. I mean, she was just amazing. And, uh, and she passed that on to me, you know, and, and so I was working with new people. I was like AA on wheels, you know, I had the coffee for the Tuesday night meeting and the chips for the Thursday night meeting and newcomers in the car. And we were having a blast. You know, I, I just fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous, but I did not know how to take this out into the world quite yet. So, um, when I was, uh, about nine months sober, I was, um, not going to graduate from high school because I hadn't been attending any classes. <laughs> because I thought if I didn't want to go, I didn't need to go. And so I wasn't showing up. I mean, it's like, you know, I have a job today and I show up whether I want to be, whether or not I want to be there because they expect me to show up. But I did not get that for a long time here. So they brought me into the office and they said, Olivia, you haven't attended uh, the majority of your classes and you're not going to graduate. And, and so um, nine months sober, I had to explain this to my sponsor. And, uh, you know, a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, had me call her before every single class, you know. Hey, Chris, I'm going into math class. Hi, Chris, I'm going into English. And uh, and I will tell you that the people in Alcoholics Anonymous have carried me on. Um, people in Alcoholics Anonymous taught me how to balance a checkbook. They taught me how to dress appropriately. They taught me how to act like a lady. I had no skills for living when I came here, and not because my well-meaning parents didn't try. I will tell you that, you know, I, the longer I'm sober, the more I respect my mother and, and what she did. You know, she was a single mom trying to raise four crazy kids. But, you know, we all were taught table manners and respect. And, you know, I knew how to speak appropriately. I just, none of those things soaked in. I did not have any skills for living. And the people in Alcoholics Anonymous sat me down. I remember sitting outside, you know, it was like our Monday night meeting. I remember sitting up at the front of the room and somebody was teaching me how to balance a checkbook. Because I kept overdrawing my bank account. And, you know, I just thought, I just, if I, I think I have money, maybe I have money. And so I would spend it, you know. And, and then I was, you know, I was crying at the meeting because I've got 8,000 overdraft fees and, you know, I can't pay my bills and all of these things. And, and people in Alcoholics Anonymous taught me how to live appropriately. They taught me how to be an adult, you know. Um, they taught me how to not swear from a podium. They taught me how to sit still during a meeting. You know, I came in AA and I had the attention span of a gnat. I mean, I just, if someone, like, touched their hair in a meeting, I was like, Bing. and I would just, it would take me, like, 20 minutes to get back to the meeting. And so I learned, sit up front, get there early, save a seat, you know, be a part of the meeting. If I'm uncomfortable, I learned to stand at the door and greet people. I learned how to stick my hand out, you know. These are little skills for life that seemed absolutely unrelated to anything practical when I was new in Alcoholics Anonymous. But I will tell you, they have, uh, they have taught me well, you know. I know how to show up to a job interview today dressed appropriately. I know how to look someone in the eye and shake their hand. And, uh, and I know how to show up to work on time, sometimes early. Um, and that's from what I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. And uh, one of the things, it, you know, this is, this is my story. And um, I was in school for the majority of my sobriety. I thought I was never going to finish. I, uh, you know, I graduated high school and I went on to college and I fumbled around college. And, um, you know, I was in this junior college for like four years. But, I, you know, I got amaz amazing experiences there. We, we uh, started a meeting on campus. Well, somebody else had started the meeting, but it was dying. And so we, you know, brought on this meeting and a few of us from my home group would go and we would sit there. And, and I got to learn about Alcoholics Anonymous traditions, you know, and the traditions in action. I was fortunate that I got sober in a group that, like, the old timers took care of it. I didn't have to make any decisions or think about the group. I just showed up and did my little coffee commitment. And, uh, you know, I got to learn that our traditions are there for a reason. I really thought they were quite boring. But, um, you know, until I, I was a few years sober and I was in this meeting and I was learning about our singleness of purpose and, you know, the seven tradition and how to keep a meeting alive and why the traditions are there, you know, it opened a whole new world for me. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big, like, I love the traditions today. And the longer I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous, the more I've fallen in love with it, you know, and that's through life's journey, through seeing this, this in action here, you know. Um, when I was a few years sober, I, I had the opportunity, my dad and I traveled to Italy, and my dad, our thing, you know, growing up, we always did road trips together, and it was like our little father-daughter bonding, and, um, you know, we got this experience to go to Italy, and now we're both sober, and, you know, it was just a new bond, and, and by about 
three or four days into the trip, we were ready to kill each other. And, uh, you know, and we got to go find a meeting. And the only meeting that was going on that night was in Italian. And I don't speak Italian, and neither does he. And, uh, you know, we went and we sat in this meeting, and it was a little 12 and 12 study. And um, I, I don't know if you've ever been to a meeting in another language, but I will tell you that although I didn't understand a word of what they were saying, the message was the same. You know, there's a, there's a magic in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, you know, it was absolutely awesome to, you know, see the 12 traditions in another language, and these people were so friendly and so kind to us, and, you know, I got to learn that my sobriety gets to be portable, and, uh, you know, when I was five years sober, I uh, I got to go, to, I like my new adventure, what I call, I got to go to real school, you know, I finally got to leave the junior college, and I got to go on to a real university, and, um, and that was a big deal, you know, I got sober in this big active group in this little cocoon in Los Angeles, and I'd never really left home, and, uh, you know, now I was moving out to Pennsylvania, and, and uh, another guy in AA was moving out to Indiana, and we packed up our car, and we had a big AA going away party, and, and we hit the road, you know, and it was one of the best road trips of my life. We, uh, we made a decision that we were not going to spend the same night in the same state, or two nights in the same state, and that we would hit a meeting in every state we drove through. And, uh, and so we had this little AA adventure, and it was right after the international convention in uh, Toronto, I think it was, in 2005. And uh, so we, we'd made all these AA friends in different parts of the country. You know, we called people up, and we went to meetings in South Dakota and in Utah, and we just had a blast. You know, we drove cross country and listened to speaker CDs, and we're swapping CDs because we caravanned. And, you know, I dropped him off in Indiana, and I went on my journey. And, and uh, for about three years, I lived out in the Altoona area and, you know, went to school out there. And I got out there, and I will tell you that um, – I had gotten sober in this big active group, and I really hadn't been forced to rely on a relationship with God. But nothing like taking you out of everything that is familiar to force you to build that relationship. And if you're new, that is not a requirement. You can do that right there in your own little cocoon. But for me, this is my experience. And, uh, you know, I, I really just kind of existed on the steps in the fellowship for a long time, and I'd never really been forced to rely on anything. And, and it was really scary. You know, I got out there, and it was like nobody knew me. No, I didn't know where anything was. And, uh, and nobody would know if I showed up at the meeting or not, you know. And, uh, and it was really overwhelming. And, you know, I was all excited. It was my first little apartment. And, uh, you know, I, I went to the store and I bought this couch. I'm all excited. I bought a pull-out couch so I could give couch commitments. Pe- newcomers come stay with me. And, uh, you know, I drive my little truck back to my house and I park outside. And I live on the second floor. <laughs> I don't have any friends. <laughs> I show up to this meeting, couch in the back of my truck, hysterically crying. <laughs> This is my first night away. I don't know anybody. I got this couch. I don't know how to get into my apartment. I don't know what to do, you know. And, and I will tell you that the love of Alcoholics Anonymous is alive and well in central Pennsylvania. And, you know, these people came over and they schlepped my couch into my apartment and gave me their phone numbers and I started my journey out there. And, you know, and, I, and I'm excited to report I, I got a new experience. You know, like I said, my group was big. And if you had, like, less than 10 years, nobody asked you to sponsor them because there were just so many old timers in the group. And so I'd never really gotten the experience of taking girls through the steps, you know. And, and where I got sober, we just, like, you sent people the book study because it was a really great book study, and they went through each, a chapter a week, and you got to read the book, and it put people in the book. And, and we didn't have that there. And so, you know, I got to sit down with these girls and take them through the 12 steps and take them through the big book, and it was such a magical experience. You know, we, I lived on a farm, and so we'd sit out on the grass in the middle of the farm and, you know, have a little picnic and read the big book. And, you know, I listen to inventories there, and, and, you know, I'm happy to report that some of those girls are still sober today, and I don't act- actively sponsor any of them, but, you know, we still talk on a regular basis, and it's absolutely beautiful, you know, to watch them sponsor girls. And, um, you know, I finished my I finished school, and I got a job in New Jersey, and, I, you know, I started my next day adventure, and I, you know, moved out to New Jersey, and yet again, you know, every time I've moved somewhere, and I've done it a few times in my sobriety, it's like, it's like being a newcomer again. You know, you start out in a new place, and nobody knows you, and they don't think you're hot stuff anymore, and you're, you know, and so I, like, had to start showing up, and it's been very humbling to have to show up and, and be new again, you know, and I've done it a few times in my Friday. I lived in New Jersey for a couple years, and again, I got to sponsor girls and, you know, like, understand that AA it works well. They may do it differently in different places, and I may have my personal opinions about the way some people are doing things, but you know what? AA is alive and well everywhere I've ever lived, and, uh, you know, um, one story I like to tell that, that uh, I skipped it is that when I, um, when I finished school, I, I had this idea that um, I could fix myself from the outside in. I wouldn't have told you that. I've learned hindsight's twenty twenty, But I had this idea that, you know, if I just had the right boyfriend and the right job and the right car and the right education, everything would be fine, you know. And I chased that idea for a long time. And, uh, you know, I was uh, about seven years sober when I finished college and um, I got an opportunity to uh, to go down and live in Central America for a month, and I, I went down to Belize, and there were there's a few meetings, maybe like three in the entire country, but um, they were never like in the same town that we were in at the same time. 
So, you know, I came down, like, with my arsenal of my 12 and 12, my big book, my speaker CDs, my iPod, and all that stuff. And, uh, but again, you know, when I feel good, no need. So about three weeks into this trip, I hate everybody I'm with. I, uh, I think they all suck. They're here for different reasons, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, I'm writing angry emails to my sponsor, and I'm 10 stepping on all of them because I hate these people. And uh, I was, I'm sure, a, a joy to be around. And, uh, you know, the fifth week of this trip, we're out on a boat in the Caribbean. We're snorkeling. It's absolutely beautiful. And somebody offers me some juice. And, uh, you know, the entire trip, I'd been really careful. I had people taste my drinks before. And, you know, I had someone taste it. They said it didn't have alcohol in it. I believed them. And, you know, I, I put that drink to my mouth. And I will tell you, it was not juice. It was rum punch. And, uh and there I am on a boat, no cell phone, middle of the Caribbean, and uh, again, hysterically crying because I think my entire sobriety has just been washed away. I've got to go back. I've got to change my date. I'm, I'm not going to be a part of AA anymore. How am I going to do this? And, um, you know, I got back to the island, and I called my sponsor, and, uh, you know, it was time for me to rededicate myself to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's really what it came to. It was time for me to let go of some of those old, old ideas and, and realize that, you know, I can have a big, beautiful, fancy life. But it really doesn't matter what's going on out there if I'm not treating my alcoholism. And, uh, you know, so I came back from that trip and, and moved to New Jersey, and I threw myself in AA again. I joined a little group there, and I started going out on speak commitments with them and giving my numbers to new girls and, and just jumped right back into this deal. You know, if you're someone who's got some time and you're slipping away from this thing, you can jump back in at any time. You know, the level of misery that I'm willing to tolerate today is far less than it was when I was six months or a year sober. You know, I can, I've had glimpses of really good living, and I just don't have much of a threshold for bad living anymore. You know, I can't do a lot of the things that I used to do, not because I'm going to run to the bar, because I don't like the way it feels in my skin. I don't like how it feels when I'm lying on my time card at work. I don't like how it feels when I'm cheating on my taxes. I just get uncomfortable. And what happens when I get uncomfortable is I start judging you. And it really doesn't matter what you're doing. I just get really judgmental. My boss is a jerk. This job sucks. I hate where I live. You know, I just, the world becomes gross. And I need a move. I'm a runner. You know, I like to plan the next move. And so I call my sponsor, and I'm like, I'm moving to London. F these people, you know. And and I have had to learn how to sit still in my sobriety, you know. And uh, when I was about 10 years sober, um, 9 or 10 years sober, I, I uh, my sponsor, who I'd been working with for a long time, you know, I, I just, I couldn't be sponsored long distance anymore. It was, I, I was able for a long time to be honest over the phone, but, you know, there came a point where I just started sneaking in, and, and I lie by omission a lot. It's my favorite defect to indulge in, and uh, I would just not mention things to her. And about three months later, I would come to her with this big mess of a problem that I expected her to suddenly fix, you know, and um, and so I needed to get someone who I could sit next to in a meeting who could see what I was doing, and, and that's what I did, you know, and this new sponsor um, has taken me on a new journey, you know, um, I really thought that I had a relationship with God before, but this woman has um, introduced me and opened new doors for me, and I, we didn't do anything, you know, extremely extraordinary. We didn't work the steps in some new and profound way. It was nothing of that sort. Um, she asked me to do a few simple things. You know, I uh, was never a big believer in meditation. I hit my knees morning and night. I said the same rope prayers. I kind of was like, yeah, 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 doing my thing. You know, I took the actions, but I didn't have a lot of faith in what they would do for me. And this woman had me start sitting down. She's like, sit down. I don't know, two minutes, light a candle, sit in front of it. I don't care. And that's what she had me start doing. And, and I started doing that. And, you know, about 30, 60, or 90 days in, I started feeling this, like, quiet calm in my life. I just, it wasn't like a white light experience. I, I'm very much someone who's had a uh, spiritual experience of the educational variety. But I just started not being so irritable. And I started being a little calmer and a less anxiety ridden. And, and it was these little things that started happening. And I started craving that. You know, I started increasing my meditation time. And, and the way that I started to relate to the world was a little different. My relationship with my mom got a little bit better, you know. Um, and that's one that, you know, when I started making amends here, um, when I walked into alcohol Alcoholics, I hated my family. I did not want anything to do with them. I thought they were an inconvenience, really. And, uh, you know, but I did the work here. I went back and I sat down with them and I made amends and paid money back that I owed. And, you know, my mom, um, I stole, like, 20s or whatever out of my mom's purse for, like, three years. And so my sponsor and I sit down, and we calculate this out, and I sit down with her, and I make my men. And she's like, oh, I'm just glad you're sober, honey. I love you. And I was like, but, Mom, I didn't tell you how much I owe you. And I told her the amount. She was like, hot damn, you can pay me that back. And, uh, you know, and so I started paying her back. I was probably a year sober when this happened. I worked a little, you know, $10 an hour job, and, and I started paying her back, you know, $5 a week. $10 a month, whatever I could afford at the time. And I lived with my mom until I was about three years sober. When I was, um, you know, I don't know, about two years sober, I, uh, we needed to move. And uh, she told me that if I took care of the move, my debt with her was free and clear. And I will tell you that um, 
My mom and my fa- my mother and father hated each other. They still don't uh, enjoy one another's company very much. They tolerate each other in a new way today, but they didn't like each other very much. And, and because I had gotten sober in my father's group, my mom really wasn't a fan of, not AA per se, but the group that I was a part of. You know, she had a lot of judgments about that group and those people because of her relationship with my father. And, uh, you know, and these people came, showed up at 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning, and they showed up at our house, and 30 people made a line, and they threw boxes into the moving van, and, and they went to the new house, and they all she had to do was stand there and point. You know, and these people formed a line again, and they moved the boxes in. She told them where to go, and, and my mom was absolutely blown away by the power of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, uh, I mean, she just couldn't believe it, you know. And at the whole time, nobody complained. You know, everybody's happy, and they're laughing, and they're joking with each other, and, you know, it was absolutely amazing to watch my mom see the magic in Alcoholics Anonymous, and, uh, you know, and that's what happened, and, and my mom and I got to start building a new relationship, and, and I'll tell you that my mom and I, when I was, like, three years sober, we were fighting worse than we had when I was drinking, because when I was drinking, I would just be like, F you, I'm out, and I would leave, but now that I was sober, I had to, like, sit still, and, uh, and I learned some important lessons, like, you know, if she's yelling and I don't yell back, she won't raise her voice. Novel to me. But that, those were the types of things that I needed to learn. And, and my mom and I started to work on our relationship, and it was rough. I mean, we had a rough time, and it got a lot better when I moved out. But, you know, like, we just really struggled. And, and I struggled because my mom's a drinker, and, and, you know, to this day, she's a heavy drinker, maybe an alcoholic. But, you know, she'd been to AA in the 90s. She was there for a couple years, and she didn't identify with all the speakers, so she doesn't think she's an alcoholic. And that's her choice. But, um, you know, I had my judgments about that for a long time, and, and uh, I like to share my opinions about it um, verbally in a loud form to her. And that's not really conducive to having a loving relationship with your mother. Um, and I had to learn how to behave differently with her. And uh, I had to learn how to change my expectations on our relationship. And, you know, it, it was really hard to do at the time. But I will tell you from those little actions of, you know, calling her on a regular basis and getting off the phone before I became angry and, and being kind to her no matter how I felt. My mom and I have an awesome relationship today. Um, she's one of my best friends, and, and she's someone that if I can't get a hold of my sponsor, I call her. You know, I trust her opinion today. Um, sometimes it's a little wacky, and thank God that I have other people to bounce them off of, but, you know, I will share things with her. My mom is very privy to what's going on in my life. And, uh, you know, in um, August of 2010, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, and um, she chose to get a double mastectomy, and I was out of the country when she had that surgery done. I was really upset that I couldn't be there with her. Um, but, you know, seconds and inches and these little God shots that happened in my life, um, a few weeks later she got really sick from uh, this surgery and infection, and she ended up um, uh, near dead, really, and she was in the intensive care unit. And because I hadn't flown home for that uh, surgery, I was able to take time off work, and I was able to fly home, and I was able to sit by my mom's bedside. And, and I will tell you, that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I didn't think about drinking, but I just thought, I can't do this. I mean, I really thought my heart was going to stop. I just couldn't handle it. And, uh, you know, I was sitting there, and I'm in the medical profession, so I'm talking to the doctors and, you know, trying to figure out what they're doing and explaining it to the 50 members of my family who want to know what's going on, and, and it was just killing me. And, and uh, you know, again, the power of Alcoholics Anonymous, the girls in my old home group, you know, they showed up. I couldn't leave the hospital, and so they came down to the hospital, and we sat out in the atrium. We sat at this little table, and, you know, we, I don't even think we had an official meeting, but we just talked to AA for an hour. You know, and it was like magic, and I was able to go back in, and, and I was able to show up for my family and be the rock that they needed to be, and, you know, like I said, I'm the youngest of this family. Um, you know, I'm the baby, and today I'm like the adult in the family, you know, and uh, I was saying in the car on the way out here, you know, because of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm like Switzerland. My family's got all kinds of drama, and I'm, I'm a neutral party, and everybody comes to me, and they share what's going on, and can you believe this, and, and you know what, I do my best, I don't share my opinions, and as a result, I'm privy to a lot of information, but, uh, you know, all these people, they share things with me, and, and I get to be that rock, and there are times that my mom calls me, and, and she's like, I need you to take me through an inventory like you do with the girls you sponsor, you know, and I'll walk my mom through a little four-step, you know, we'll talk about, like, what's your resentment, and what's your part, and, you know, well, maybe you could act differently, and what can you do to change, because Cindy's not going to change, and you know, we get to do these things today, and, and it's really fun, you know, and, and uh, I was just home a couple weeks ago, and like I said, my mom's a heavy drinker, and she's not working right now, so she spends most of her day on the bar stool, you know, and there was a lot of, long time that I, I wasn't able to be around alcohol, you know, but um, because my sobriety is portable today, I, uh, you know, I hung out. I wanted to spend time with my mom, so I hung out at the bar. You know, I spent a lot of my trip home next to my mom at a bar stool, meeting all her friends and hanging out with people. And, and I will tell you that the thought of drinking didn't cross my mind once, you know. And they all know I'm sober and that I don't drink. And so the minute I walk in, there's iced tea sitting there, you know, and they take care of me. And, 
you know, it's not particularly where, you know, I enjoy spending my free time, but I wanted to spend time with my mom. And you know what? That's where my mom is. I don't try and change her today. She is who she is, so I'll go to where she is. And that's the relationship that we get to have today. And, you know, as a result, now that I've stopped trying to change her and form her into who I think she should be, we have a great relationship, you know, and she absolutely loves me. And, you know, I've had similar struggles with my father. And, you know, my father's an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, but sometimes we do AA very differently. And I may have my opinions about that or the choices that he makes in his life. But, you know, what? we get to have a good relationship today, mostly because I learned to keep my mouth shut. You know, I will tell you that my family, they are who they are, and I don't, they haven't changed much, but, um, you know, I have gotten to change, and I have been able to become a person who is kind and considerate, and, you know, if I don't have nothing, anything nice to say, I try not to say it, you know, and that's why I have a sponsor and the steps and, and a 10 step, and, you know, I get to inventory and talk to my friends, and, and it's so important for me to have friends, and, you know, as a result of, of being a member of, of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, my life has just continued to get better from the outside and from the inside. And, you know, I do have a big fancy life today. Um, at least it would have impressed me when I was new. You know, I had this little job, and it, it's a dream job for me. You know, I've had a couple jobs since I finished school, and uh, I um, I really wanted to, to take this opportunity, and, and, uh, and that's what I did. And, I, you know, I get to work in trauma today, and um, it's intense, and there's a lot. And they go for beers all after work all the time. You know what I mean? 7 a.m., we're coming off a shift, and they're like, let's go for morning beers, you know, because it's an intense job. And that's what they like. That's how they like to decompress. And you know what? None of that bothers me today. I can be around alcohol. I can, you know, be in the workplace. And, and I will tell you that this job has been an amazing experience. Um, it doesn't treat my alcoholism by any means. Um, but it does give me an opportunity to be on the front lines of alcoholism. And, uh, you know, we had someone a, a few weeks ago who uh, was really drunk, and her kids locked her out of the house, and so she climbed up on the top of a third-story window. Because um, I'm sure it sounded like a great idea at the time. And uh, and she fell. You know, and this woman broke almost every bone in her body. And uh, and I will tell you that I was standing there in that surgery, and I thought to myself, that could be me. I should be on the other side of this operating table. And, uh, you know, it's because of Alcoholics Anonymous and rooms like this and people like you that I have a very different life today. You know, most of the people in my life today that aren't an Alcoholics Anonymous, when they find out I don't drink, like, can't even believe that I would have lived any other way. Not that I would have, you know, they just, one, don't get why I wouldn't drink. And, two, they don't understand when I start telling them, you know, the way that I used to drink and why it's a better idea for me and the rest of the world if I refrain from alcohol, you know, they just don't get it, you know. And, uh and they can't believe it because the person I resemble today is nothing like the girl that walked into Alcoholics Anonymous 12 years ago. You know, it's just nothing like that person. Um, like I said, I have great relations with my family. You know, I've been able to travel sober. I'm, I have this experience in Alcoholics Anonymous where, like, I put something out into the universe, and never in my time, but really in God's time, you know, everything that I have thus far put out into the universe has at some point come back to me. You know, I uh, I was living in Los Angeles, and I was like, I hate L.A., I'm sick of this place, I want to live somewhere, I want to live in the middle of nowhere, you know. And I ended up going to college in the middle of a farm in central Pennsylvania, you know, and from drastically different worlds, and I got to have my experience there. And, you know, it's uh, not particularly for me, but, you know, that's, that was my experience. It's what I wanted, you know, and I said I wanted to travel. And, you know, like I told you, when I was seven years sober, I got to go to Belize. When I was three years sober, I got to go to Italy. And, you know, if you're new, um, I don't know what your dreams are. And, uh, frankly, it doesn't matter. But what I can tell you is that I am an excellent starter. But before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I really liked the beginning. I'm out of the gate fresh, and I wanted the end result. But I never had the patience to sit through the middle. And what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me has introduced me to the middle. You know, it's taught, taught me how to show, suit up and show up and be present for whatever's going on in my life. And sometimes that's unpleasant. Let me tell you, I've had some nasty breakups in AA. I've had my heart stomped on, my car, you know, I've had financial issues. I have had the gamut, you know. But no matter what, I've suited up and showed up for life and for Alcoholics Anonymous. And as a result, most of those things pass. You know, there was a speaker in AA, Norm Alpe, who used to say, you know, if it's good, soak it up because it's going to get salty later. You know, and that's my case. Like, if things are rough, they've been rough, you know. And I've had periods where I'm feeling spiritually unfit and I'm uncomfortable in my skin and I hate the world. And you know what? I get to throw myself back in AA. You know, and I've had periods. These, I, there was a period where I had, like, five months in a row where, like, I felt like I was just coasting. I was like, this is awesome, you know. And that period ended, and I was like, dang, <laughs> like, why doesn't that get to keep coming, you know? But life happens. Things happen. And, you know, what I have learned today is that there are things in Alcoholics Anonymous that work. You know, these steps work. The 12 traditions work, you know, the 12 concepts, meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, sharing this message with girls I sponsor, when problems arise in whatever area of my life, you know, if I throw myself harder into others, 
those problems will resolve themselves. Sometimes it means I need to take action, but you know what? When I stop trying to fix it all and figure it all out, the answers tend to come. You know, whether they're from somebody else or, a, a, you know, a feeling that I get inside, whatever it may be, those answers come and things will resolve themselves. I was thinking today, um, there's a book, it's not officially a approved literature, um, but there's a book, it's called Siddhartha, and I've talked to my girls that I sponsor a lot about it. And uh, the idea in this book, it's like a little Buddhist book, but basically it talks about how life is like a river, you know, and that river's flowing and the water's coming. And, uh, and you can either go, by, go with the flow or you can be dragged. You know, and, uh, and sometimes that water changes course. You know, there's a stick or a rock, and the water's got to move around it. You know, and that happens. Life has thrown me some curveballs, and I have had to learn how to move around things. You know, people that I don't get along with, or jobs that I'm not happy in, or, you know, relationships that aren't working out. Whatever it may be, you know, things happen, and I have to learn to maneuver around those things. And I can fight it kicking and screaming and throw temper tantrums and be immature and be a real winning example for the newcomer in Alcoholics Anonymous, or... You know, I can act like a lady of dignity and grace, you know. And uh, I can't tell you that I'm 100% either one of those, but I can tell you that for the most part, I try to work for the force of good today. And it has served me well. You know, I have a really beautiful life today. Um, I, I, like I said, I have this little job that uh, there's a lot of people that would want nothing to do with this job. But you know what? It's my dream job, and I absolutely love it. You know, and I go to work, and I'm excited to go to work. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that it's, it's totally messed up my meeting schedule, you know, and I, I don't get to go to my home group as often as I like. And I, I've had to find new meetings. And I don't like that because it means meeting new people and it's uncomfortable. You know, I don't like walking in a room with people I don't know. Um, I wish everybody in New York was as friendly as you guys. I really apologize if any New Yorkers listen to this tape. But, but you know what? Sometimes I have to be the, the bigger person. i got to stick my hand out. And I don't always like doing that. Sometimes I want to be a taker in AA. And you know what? Um, it's never served me well. It has never served me well to be a taker in Alcoholics Anonymous. When I walked into AA 12 years ago, um, I had absolutely no interest in, there was a guy who used to say, you know, like, take a commitment here, join our happy band of givers, you know, and uh, it was so corny to me at the time. But I will tell you that um, as I do that more and more in my sobriety, and uh, I absolutely love being a part of the givers in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it's just a wonderful ride. I love watching the light come on in a new girl's eyes or, you know, watching some guy who's slamming ashtrays down a few months later laughing and talking with someone at the meeting. That, to me, is better than any drink I've ever had, you know. Um, there's a saying that often gets mixed up in AA that, uh, you know, my worst days sober are better than my best days drinking, and uh, that is not the case for me. I had some really great days drinking. I had a lot of fun. Um, it didn't last long, but I did have a lot of fun days out there. But I will tell you, I wouldn't trade them for the world today. You know, I have a really good life today, and not every day is a walk in the park, but, uh, you know, I would not trade my worst days in sobriety for my best days drinking. If you're new, I really hope that you jump in here. Get yourself a sponsor. Ask them to take you through the steps. Join our happy band of givers. You know, jump in here. We have a lot of fun. You know, that's car ride on the way out today. We were laughing and giggling the whole time. You know, it's a blast here. Um, I really hope that you join us. Get yourself a big book and jump in. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.